Welcome to Wright's house, live from Barclays. Agbonga! <laughs> Watch out, Stevie. Oh, mate, come on, in my house, really? He's not winning in my house, bro. It's in my bed, man. That's where the action is, baby. The ladies, this is what it's all about. Emma A's owns this, bro. Man's won it, man. This is what they're all after, bro. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Wrighty's House Live with Barclays. Please give a warm welcome to the stage, Musa Konga, Emma Hayes, Ryan Hahn, and of course, Ian Wright. Come on. Yes. We see them. Good day, sir. I'm here. Hey, thank you, man. Thanks very much. Welcome. Welcome to Wright's House Live um, with our dear friends, Barclays. Thank you very much, Barclays. Barclays, our people, bro. Barclays been, Barclays been helping me for years, man. Thank you very much for this. Um, got to introduce my guys, the brains of everything. Nothing happens without Ryan Hunt, man. Ladies and gentlemen, Ryan Hunt. Hello. Half of the, half of the, half of the stadio duo, the great stadio. The other half is Mr. Musa Kwongo. Um, in his beautiful, his beautiful, he's, he's out dripped me. Something, under, some, 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 something understated. And understated. Then, the, then, then the goat man is the, the one. My dear friend, is, I, I love her so much. She's the best. Football pundit of the year. Emma Hayes, man. Chelsea manager Emma Hayes. So, women's football weekend. Yeah. I, I quite like the women's football weekend. You, got, you guys got City, right? You hammered them the other day. You hammered them the other day. You think you're going to get a tougher game against them, guys? You know how it is, second game around. Mm. It's always a different game. And I always think every time you beat an opponent, just like you learn yourself, it's a chess game. Mm. They then figure out what they, what they did well, build mm. upon that. We then have to counter that to make sure we're prepared for the unexpected. Uh. And it's cat and mouse. Then it kicks off and then... It's either a game where it confirms that what you've prepared for was right, mm. and if it's not because you've messed that up, you have to adapt quite quickly. Seen, seen. That's right. what coaching is. I That's think. what coaching. I think. Right. In respect to the weekend, it's a, it's, a, it's yep. a great thing, right? Yeah, absolutely. Something's needed. Yeah, definitely. I think we we talk about women's football quite a lot on Wright's House and on Stadio, and um, for us, it kind of just seems like a, it seems like a no brainer. And it's super exciting. I think it's really good that the weekend's game, uh, the women's game gets their own weekend in, in England. And uh, it's always a really good weekend. It's a, it's a good weekend everywhere because we live in Germany, Musa and I, and we watch the Frauen Bundesliga quite a lot. And if you're, I'm not sure if I'm allowed, if you're not watching that, it's also quite a good league. Mm -hmm. um, and it's super exciting. So it's good to see the women get a, a weekend where, you know, if, if people aren't watching the international stuff, then all eyes are on them in a football sense. And there's a North London derby. And Moose, with the, with the, I, I, what I would like to see more of is, like, now with Sky and the BBC and that, and obviously the, you want to see more stuff with the women's game where the content, so people can see it. Sky got to do more for me in respect of the magazine stuff, the concerts, they're putting it out there so people can be more aware. It's funny you mention that, like, in a German context, I was looking at the, I was talking before, actually, Wolfsburg, most successful women's team for a while, and um, they were on a great run. Their social media numbers... They were like one of the best teams in Europe, maybe the best at one point, and they were like not even the top 20 in interactions. So the marketing was not happening. And I'm like, whoa, this is wild, right? Like that's a premium product, if we're yeah. going to talk about that. And it wasn't getting the attention. And we see that actually like the kind of social stands that women are taking, right? You see it in women's NBA, they're leaders in that in terms of activism. Yes. Women's football, they're leaders. It's like, hang on a minute. If we're really interested in building an inclusive, progressive game where everyone's welcome, because football is, we say it for Stadio, like football's for everyone then why aren't we maximizing that? Why are we tapping into that? It's very frustrating. Can I just mention something actually? It's quite interesting that Musa sat next to Emma because he was not happy when Penilla Harder left Wolfsburg. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to have words. <laughs> yeah, I was not. Oh, he was going to ask to swap. So. <laughs> Sorry, we'll talk about that later. Sorry. But it's, it's, it's a sore point. Ems, I've got to say as well with you guys and our Chelsea, because Chelsea look ominous, man. You know, I know Arsenal are... Arsenal are doing their stuff as well. I feel like we're going to give you a bit of a chase in if I'm really totally honest. It's going to go toe-to-toe. -to -toe. But, but the thing with it is, Ems, is that you're looking at it now. I'm, feeling, I'm looking at Arsenal and Chelsea. I think that that's, that's the battle. But the third place, you know, is, is something that's quite interesting for me. Third place, because I, I, I like the look of Brighton. I like the way Brighton, what Hope Powell's doing at Brighton. And I remember you said that Brighton will beat a lot of teams. 
I mean, they're built to do it this way, yeah. not in a rush, take their time, proper recruitment, brilliant coaching, great culture, £8 million facility, all for the girls, which I think is amazing, something everybody can reflect on. Um, but I think that the race for third will go the whole way because I, I always think, just like anything in football, I'd, like I said, playing Man City a week ago and playing them now, you learn certain things. The second half of the season, that's when I think fixtures mm. become even tougher because that's when teams get into their strides. You size each other up, you figure it out, as long as you keep players healthy. And the, the big difference now is because everybody's been professional a few years, squads are larger, mm. you're no longer getting the situations where the those with less players fall away. I felt like Everton to... in a way, it was Everton had a double whammy last year because it was a squad depth and... People kind of worked them out, maybe. And it's almost like each year a new team has a chance to have a pop at the top three or four. Almost yeah. a lot. But stability is the most important thing. Everybody tipped Everton, and I thought that was ludicrous, mm. not because they weren't, they're not good players, they're top players. But someone asked me this question earlier. It took Panila Harder a whole year to settle in, and Sam Kerr at least six months, at least, maybe right, a right. little bit longer. And that's the reality for those Everton players when you've had eight or nine come in. It's difficult for Hope. She's had that group and it's established. And I think that's what the difference is. There's an interesting thing developing in the Barclays WSL with this kind of middle class that Musa always talks about. Musa always talks about the Premier League middle class. And I think it's been really interesting seeing that develop and the, the level of that come up because you can't half step anymore. Not that you could ever half step, but I think that What's, what's happened to City this season, for example, even with, yeah, they've had injuries. Actually, yeah, I might be interested to see whether the, what's happened to City this season or Manchester United based on what happened to them last season, does that make the top two or three sides kind of sweat a little bit more, knowing that it's not as, not nailed on, maybe? No, I, I think you, everybody underestimates what it takes to stay at the top. Mm. It's not, I say it all the time, people come into our building, whether it's new players or star, and I always say to them, well, we're the best team because we've got the most money. And I say it facetiously because the work to stay at the top is always underestimated. Mm. Yeah. If you don't, if you don't evolve, and it's not as simple as just evolving, you've got to make difficult decisions all the mm. time. To, to change your squads, to change your training, to change your staff. You have to keep everybody on their toes. And to do that, that's, that's a lot of work. It's easy to just say, oh, we're at the top and we're going to stay there because we're Chelsea or Arsenal or we're City. You have to work to be in that place. And I can only speak about my own team. The minute I always think you get comfortable is the minute you're dead. Actually, I actually want to jump in about the adjustments that Chelsea have made. That's fascinating. You've gone to like this sort of, this three, four, three, which I'm loving. It's, yeah. it's bold. What was the thinking behind that, that change? Well, ask the fan group. They have a lot to say about it. <laughs> <laughs> actually, should I, should, I, should I get Chelsea Williams ready up right now? Shots fired. <laughs> it's probably a combination of things. First of all, I believe in principles of play. So if you've got strong principles, attacking and defending, you can do anything you want. Secondly, formations only apply out of possession. So if you're setting up against the team, you might say, I don't know, we're going to play in a 3-5-2, show to that side, win the ball there. Next game, it might be that you're in a 4-4-2. So formations, for me, this archaic conversation we have about formations is so ridiculous. So let's start with that. Secondly, it's about roles. Just make sure you're establishing roles. So if, without trying to give too much away, probably over years figuring out the differences between the women's and the men's game and figuring out, I track, we track things in our environment from every goal, which player's been involved in, in every goal, where our goals are scored from, the pass assists, the assists, the assist locations, then the goals. And you start to get some trends in and around your behaviours your behaviours then shape some of your methodology. That methodology then has to be rehearsed again and again and again. But every now and then when the players are comfortable, <laughs> rug goes again, <laughs> have to pull the rug. The rug goes. The minute I see the cigar out on the deck chair, at the halfway line, <laughs> ciao, lunch is gone. As you I mean, that's part of it. I hope they're not listening to this. Love it. That just reminded me of something I wanted to ask you, actually, because um, mention, mentioning data, you made a lot of a lot of us and a lot of other people very happy in the summer by mentioning 
expected assist, assists on ITV. Mm. And it was a real, it was a that lot of... upon it a year. That was a lot. Yeah, it was a it's lot. Only of on four twi times. <laughs> Twitter. That's how good. She's only on four times. Pun it a year. Killed it. Dead. Like, Killed it. Dead. Honestly. Sorry. It's Sorry, like Ray. in out. Get the money. Exactly. That four was, touches, yeah. four goals. <laughs> yeah, but that was yeah. No but that one was, gets um, hurt. Just I went through that. There was a phase where I went through where just for some reason I just, you know, you see stuff and you say I'm, I'll just leave it. I couldn't leave it, right? And they were coming. I literally I was in there fighting, bro. I was just hammering people, man. Hammering the Neanderthals because I'm trying to explain to them, watching a game, watching the game, watching the England games, and me and Em's watching it there. Emma's seeing stuff that I can't see, mm. couldn't see. And when she's giving those people that insight and you, you're reading some of the stuff, you just think, you know something? Yeah, I just said, before that was close, because I nearly swore there, because I said, I'm not gonna swear, but I just wanted to just, I just want to ram it down their throats in that. And so when I heard that Emma got the, the punnet of the year, it just made me really smile, really smile. Because for some reason, we're getting this, the, the negativity from these, there's a, there's, a, there's a section of men who watch football, who feel they own football. Mm. And the women's game, whatever they think about it, it's, it's so inferior. So someone like Emma coming out and talking to them and telling them uh, what's going on, with this, it was beautiful to listen to. Beautiful to listen to. Can we just have a round of applause for Emma Willing? <laughs> You've got to get that love. But that's what's going to change. That's, how it, that's what changes it, Moose. When they actually sit down and think, Jesus Christ just got schooled. Do you know what I was actually, not to embarrass you again, Emma, but since we're embarrassing you right now, let's carry on. Um, the great piece you wrote for The Athletic about the two defensive midfielders before the yeah. tournament, a lot of people going, nah, don't see the point. And then like, the tournament begins. And all of a sudden, I was, it was a quote I always use from Warren Buffett. It's only when the tide goes out, you've seen he's been swimming naked. <laughs> and teams using one defensive midfielder are just getting absolutely well, over. Thank God that weren't me naked. <laughs> 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 but what was that? So you done that? Why would you do that? So, so explain to people what you said about that the, the two the, the two holding midfielders and why why you said that. Ems. Look, think of personnel. Mm. At the end of the day, we're coaching people, not robots. It's not Sabutio. It's not football manager. There are people, and their skill set is very different. So the I think part of the application for England was based on the fact that the teams that went the furthest in the tournament were often 1-0 games. So clean sheets was the key driver, in my opinion. So to have clean sheets, you have to be in positions where you're protecting the central areas of the pitch in the first phases and the second phases, and you're not going to do that with a single pivot. That's the first thing. The second is England's build-up play in our back four isn't famous for being... Brazilian or Spanish, yeah. let's say. No offence. So the last thing you want then is marauding midfielders, expansive play, transition play, and then maybe running at our, you know, 1v1 with certain players in our back three or back four. So perhaps some of that was the first thing. Secondly, he's a manager or a player that his safety is in security in terms of getting organisation right when the team is in possession has been synonymous with his reign. Mm. But, and he was correct about what he did with the group of players he did f to get the team where it is. But equally, to progress, like I know this from coaching, you need the experiences of doing it. And England, what, manage, managing the expectation and pressure in the summer to perform. I think only a few people really realise how difficult that is mm. to play in a final of that magnitude to perform at your top level and then do what I what was the best chess match of the summer, Mancini versus Southgate and watching the master, the maestro in the Italian touchline play around with pinning England's back five with a combination of Chiellini's, you know, higher role to, to, to keep them in 3v2 overloads. Amazing coaching. The, the interesting thing that Southgate, I'm sure, will ponder is like, well, how does, does the team keep evolving to the next level? And I'm, I'm sure they'll get there. The levels. The levels, the levels. Oh. Jesus. Where did it start, Ems? How old was you when you'd realised that you had that? You can see a game and you can dissect it like that. Well, I grew up with four television channels, so we can't sit here and say we watch football day because... <laughs> <laughs> 
Noddy, maybe, <laughs> Dungeons and Dragons, and of course, Football Italia. Mm. And that's where it started. Yeah. Football. Yeah, my dad's Italian, and it was just drilled into us to sit there. And I thought it was the most sophisticated program because you had, you know, I forget his name. James I, Richardson. Oh, I love him. I no, love some James. Pastries. James Richardson. He's like my hands down favourite bringing out Gazetta, you know, and there it was, these papers, thing on the side. I mean, this was, oh, I was a bambino, I was 10 watching this and then going through the Milan years, the, you know, the Juventus years, but even at the time the Arrigo Sacchi years. So very, from very early on, I understood that football was serious. Mm. It was serious business and it was constantly having conversations about that and then just obviously replicating it as a child and growing up. I just loved it. I couldn't get it out of my bones. I wanted to. I tried to lose it from me, but my sister sat in the front row. <laughs> never really had all the, you know, terrible dolls, houses and things like that. It was, it was match, shoot, football, football, <laughs> anything related to it. And it just didn't, it's just been in me. And I'm, it, I'm, even now, I watch football in my spare time as well. I try not. It's like an addiction. I try not to watch it. I try. You got Man City this weekend. Uh, for those who don't follow the Barclays WSL too much. Any players to look out for, either playing in your game or elsewhere? Yeah, I mean, I mean I'll, I'll speak for the opponent, but they got an amazing left-sided player in Lauren Hemp, yes. mm. who is an exciting talent that, that England can look forward to for a number of years. She really is. She's exceptional live and pitch side, and I think she's probably the most talented um, player for the opponent. Mm. For us... Oh, wow. <laughs> no way. I never play favourites. But, you, you know, Ji So Young's an amazing footballer, but she's not my favourite. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you've got Frank Kirby, Penila Harder, Sam, Sam Kerr, and Cuthbert Guru, right? And the list goes on. But an amazing team. But two amazing teams, I think, that have had huge tactical battles over the year. And you've got a traditional 4 3 3 playing against the 3-4-3. So it'd be an epic battle on how their wide players are going to pin our wing backs and vice versa, how we're going to exploit certain spaces when they invert players and how we're going to kill them on the transition. But any clues? see how it plays any, out. Any clues about I thought, this? I thought she was going to drop the mic. I saw you getting from me. See you later, everyone. We get mullered 4-0 at the weekend. I won't get another job. <laughs> <laughs> what are you looking forward to? Um, I probably have to say, um, Mike. I probably have to say, um, obviously the Arsenal game. I'm really pleased with the way they're playing at the moment. The manager's kind of got them going. He's got some energy. I watched them against Everton, and I ain't gonna lie. Was, you know, there was one time I kind of caught him glimpsed the camera, and he started to liven himself up even more. I thought, what are you doing? What are you acting up for? What you think he likes the camera? I'm thinking he might like it. Um, you know what I mean? But um, I like the way we're playing. You know, Katie McCabe. Amazing scene. You know, amazing. I, I love Katie McCabe. And, and obviously what Beth Mead's doing, I like the fact that they rested um, Viv Medium the other day because I think that she's going to need that every now and then. But you want people like Beth coming in. Nikita Paris needs for me to just to kick on and do a little bit more. Manham's, fuck, I love her. She's, mag and, uh, again, and, wow, well, that was close. And then we've got Lotta, Lotta Woman Moy, who I think is going to, again, she's going to, at some stage, she's going to be a England regular. So, Quite excited about Arsenal, so yeah, me too. fancy Arsenal. Mm. Me too. Me, nice one, right? Musa? I would still say Chelsea City, and actually from the perspective of City, because I'm always fascinated by how great teams fight back and recover. So less than they were wobbling last year, oh, last week, sorry. And they really came back strong. And I'm always, they've got a lot of ground to make up, but I'm almost thinking, can they use this as a way to springboard themselves, maybe like more broadly? So mm. yeah. That's why no two games are the same, because it won't play out the same. Absolutely, And if yeah. you have that advantage from whatever, just being victorious first time around, I think the second game is always so interesting because tactics change again. It's funny, actually, just in the men's context, you saw, like, Tuchel getting a good look at Pep's uh, City and vice versa, and you yeah. just saw Tuchel solving problems, didn't you? Each match he tweaks You have something. to. You have to yeah. keep evolving. It's not even... It's play-by-play, play and you, yeah. you, there'll be some moments team will do something in the first half they'll make a tactical change second half you can't always recognize yeah sometimes why it's happening but then you get the review of that and then you have to play the game of are they more likely to do what they did second Actually, half or, or be favorite, better at what who are your favorite in-game managers Tuchel. the ones you like 
He's your favourite. Oh, yeah. He's, he's amazing, isn't he? Yeah, he's a master at it. But I, I think, yeah, he's he's my favourite. But I enjoy watching Pep. Who doesn't? Who wouldn't Do, uh, like him? But I'm, I'm going to enjoy Antonio Conte because I remember when he was at Chelsea, he was immense. So you Tottenham fans, you should be excited at some point they might actually score a goal. <laughs> <laughs> Because they, they've not had touches in the box. Um, so. They haven't had any trophies. That's your favourite stat. Wow. No, it's not my favourite. I think, I think it's absolutely devastating. It's just like for Harry Kane not to have any touches in the boxing games. It's criminal. Wow, there he is. Yeah, yeah he's come on. You hit that well. <laughs> <laughs> not, in the, sort of not in the WhatsApp group now, man. No, I'll, I'll leave it. I'll leave that. Um, so it's the third season of Barclays' sponsorship yes. of the FAWSL. But Barclays been around in football for what twenty twenty is twenty years now, right? So much so that we refer to our top men's league purely as the Barclays. Barclays. So we've picked some iconic moments. Yes. Right here. What's yeah. one of your iconic moments? Um. Well, to be honest, Shearer's volley. Huh? Shearer's volley. Shearer's, Shearer's volley against Villa was beautiful because it wasn't a. Um, like Shearer, people had him down as like hot shot Hamish because everything's a blast with Shearer, blast and everything. But like he scored a goal against Villa where I can't remember the left back or something. He must have hit it 40 yards. Do you remember the goal? He, it must have hit it 40 yards. And we're talking, he was on, he was on the, like outside the, the six yard box and Schmeichel was in goal and he side foot volleyed it back. Eduardo style, actually. Honestly. Yeah. It was, and, and I remember, I remember even, even saying to him all the time, I always mention the goal to him because he loves it. He loves it because like, he, he doesn't get that kind of love like for his, his subtleness. That was a beautifully taken goal. It was like beautiful. It's art. You know? That one was beautiful. He did more of that again for Blackburn actually. You know, like on Southampton, you know, the early, yeah, the chips, chips you know, like and stuff. you watch someone's career evolve and the finishing. Like, you know, Messi never used to smack it until couple of years in and Shearer was kind of Shearer actually the power was not the most dominant feature of his finishing I thought early on actually I know. probably had to do more you know when you think about Newcastle being more of a service into the box one mm. touch finishing perhaps right. it, the, the type of service change and maybe earlier in his career he had to do a little bit more for yeah, himself yeah. Yeah, absolutely but you had another one right well, I made you do <laughs> well the one one what was really um really dear to me and there's so many but it was my son Sean mm. And the reason why is I was remember I was at home and he was playing for Chelsea and um, he, was, he was getting stick just, just because. And I remember sitting there and I'm very nervous um, when he's playing anyway. It's, it's, it's so nerve wracking um, watching. I'm, I'm just hoping that he just doesn't give the ball away. And like every time he, he got the ball and he, he didn't, he was, he, was, he was very good like that. But I remember every time he got, he got so much stick off the West Ham fans, but then he, he scored this goal. It just made me, I burst into tears at home and like and, and I was so happy because I didn't care if they lost after that because that's what you do you're not bothered you just want him to do well but then he scored a second goal and like he's, 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 he's the way he celebrated it was just it's, it's the one you know it just comes back to me such an emotional celebration that he's like turned around to Wayne Bridge right but the, he's kind of drifted onto the West Ham side of the, the stadium and like the Chelsea fans are like five yards behind him but yeah. he's just can't see it's it. Just cut. I know, I know, but like you know what? It's it's it's, it's hard because I, I wish it's this kind of thing I wouldn't want to watch the game because I was so nervous watching him. Even worse for England, so so worse. So to watch him um, playing that game and score those two goals, it was just like I, I couldn't have been happier if it was me scoring them in a in, in a final or something. So it's horrible. I, people think that oh my son, I'd love my son to be a player, I'd love him to be a top player, this and that. It's it's, it's, it literally rips your insides out watching them play. Rips them out. So you're just hoping that they do well. I'm not bringing the football out. I, I'm quite happy if my son doesn't play. <laughs> really? <laughs> After that. <laughs> I want to live a long life. Uh, Emma, you picked one that's going to be hard for me and Wrighty to listen to. I, I, I think for every fan, if you your team has not won a lot as a fan, and I'm not one of them, mm -hmm. is it Aguero's goal? Because all I kept thinking was, I just want to be one of them fans. I want that feeling, that last moment. It's that, that's dreamy. That's statues for the rest of his life. That is hands down, you know, probably 
a moment where I thought, oh, I'm just, I'm happy for them as fans, even if yeah. I don't like Man City. That, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't you have another one from of one of your own? Oh, one of her own, sorry. It has to be, hands down, the 4-1 win away at Arsenal. And boring word. That was oh, wow. yeah. a fabulous day out. In fact, I nearly smashed my head on the dugout uh, when the third went in because I couldn't believe how breathtaking we were. But you know what? It's like anything. You just take, if you take your chances in games, when you're that decisive, you, when it's your day, you you know, very clinical, and we were very, very clinical. It was Sam Kerr's first goal. That felt I felt like a demonstration, it. that game. Was it the Sophie Ingle one from distance? Oh, it was ridiculous. It was a ridiculous finish. I think I did actually say we should, we should go home now. That's, that's the end of that. <laughs> you know those goals, Shout. you know they're in for the moment they hit. You just watch the line of you're like, that's in. That's what it's I like, mean. Like, when, it's, when, when things run for you, that, those things happen. You know, and, that, and people don't actually realise that when you... Your team's winning. When you're the winning team, all of a sudden it's the bar, the line, and in. And when it, you're the nearly team, it's the bar, the line, and it's out. And that happens from your ear. That I think that season, you know, we were scintillating. Yeah. You were. Yeah, we watched a lot of it that year. Um, Musa? Uh, mine was the Wayne Rooney overhead kick. <coughs> February 2011, the derby. Uh, it's like the last 15 minutes, and it's one all. And it was funny because it was like, that was the arm wrestle. It was like City were coming. And of course they are what they are now, but they were like, the negotiation was still happening. It was like the community shield or the rest. It was like, this was, a, this was like wild. And um, Rooney actually wasn't having the best game. And Skulls fizzes it out to the right. Nanny crosses it in. And the thing about Rooney I love is one of the greatest improvisational footballers. He's like this sort of Jackson Pollock of like footballers. Like just give him like a canvas and just let him go on it. And it's funny because Michael Richards was talking about this goal. Like the ball gets crossed in, it gets deflection off, um, off someone that's getting crossed in. And Michael Richards was like, I turned around and I saw Wayne Rooney up in the air. I was like, what's he doing there? There's <laughs> 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 the thing, and it's, then he's like, oh. <laughs> and it's like, the way the ball enters the net is so clean. Like I'm obsessed with bicycle kicks. Like Van Basten, it's like, I'm obsessed. And the way it enters the net is so clean. It was like the end of an argument. It's amazing because, like, yeah. when you when you see it, and you, it, it kind of it doesn't even come off his foot. It comes off his. He said he shinned it. It's the it's the it's the best shin I've ever but seen. But it's his body movement. But it's but about Rooney is it's his eyes. It's his. It's like a the way he sees it. You just watch him like imagining it, and that's it's the an thing. outswinger. Yeah, it makes it easy. Yes. I think it's an in swinging going away. Same thing him. don't yeah. happen. Yeah. With the genius of it as well as like you just see the imagination. Like for me, football like the great football is, is vision, and to even improvise to think that possible. Berbatov was talking about this. He's like, that's the goal I wish I'd scored. And you can know, because Berbatov is like, you know, he's got his little collections. Berbatov's like an artist. He's like, hmm, I wish I'd painted that one. You can see him. Yeah, yeah, he loves it. Yeah, but Ber Burkamp's against, New against Newcastle was beautiful yeah. simply because... <laughs> sim simply because when you speak to Dennis, right? Yeah. Speak to Dennis and it's, it's brilliant because he's not looking for any kind of like, yeah, I've done something amazing. When you speak to him, the first thing Dennis says was, Robert Perez passed the ball. It was a poor pass to me. It was behind me, mm. right? So when he, he said that, so he said, so he, he, was, he, was, he was expecting it in here, so it was behind him. So he had to go back for it. Mm. And so he says, when I touched it, my body was turned around to the point where, well, I can't turn back that way because... Yeah. That's why you can't it. replicate yeah. the touch because it's uncanny. It's, it's uh, yeah. unorthodox. Mm. It and doesn't it, happen. And, and the ability, what he done, he said, so my natural reaction, because he's such, he's, he's thinking, he's, he's so... So clever. He said, well, my natural reaction, just turn that way. Just, just turn the way you are. And he, he said then after that, it was just all straightforward. And the way he ran away when he celebrated, it's like he didn't even realise what, what he'd done because we've not seen a goal like that before with that kind of touch and we've not seen one after. It was improvisation. And just spin I'd the say, ball with the inside of your foot. Yeah, it was amazing. It's like, it was you know, amazing. You know, the Benzema goal on Euro is where he takes that touch from behind it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, well, yes. That's just a prime example of elite level strikers thinking on the fly. Mm. Where it's just like you have the skill set, you're literally at your feet, I suppose, and in your brain. Where if the if a pass isn't where you need it to be, you can improvise something like that. Like, but you need the speed of play to do it. Yeah. Because often, if you do that at a much slower level, you can't replicate the same no. thing. It's no. to, those things are generally yeah. I mean, there might be some 
parts that are carried out in training. But it's only in games when the level is that high that you see that level of artistry. But that's the thing with a player of, of, of that calibre and class is that for a pass that he saw as... So I'm just thinking, Dennis, the first thing he's thinking he's had is, this ball's behind me. You know, and then he touched it with the left foot like he did. And like people said, did he mean it? Did he mean it? The fact is, he, he done it. He's, he's, he's done it. He's, he's improvised himself to get himself in a position uh, to and, do and it. What so most, be asking that and question. what most people don't realise, because Vic used to tell me this, Vic Akers, Vic had to drive him home probably when you lot got on the plane because he would never fly. Yeah, but he would leave. He didn't. He would never fly. He wouldn't go on a plane. Yeah, but when, it's really European funny. European games, yeah, right. It's, it's really strange because when we heard the rumour that Dennis don't fly, we are like, <laughs> yeah, fine. And then when we when we leaving for the airport, we all, the first time, I remember we all went, I think we was going to Turkey or something, uh, uh, Athens, we was going to Greece. And then we said, yeah, where's Dennis? We literally went there, but he left like three days before because yeah. him and... <laughs> Him and Vic Akers used to drive there. That's why him and Vic are so tight. They, they, they used to drive. That's why I used to coach to the team. That's why I literally from being the assistant coach, I used to lead in many games because Vic was like, I've got to leave two days early to take Dennis, take Dennis to, to wherever. And like, he, he had no problems. He had no problems with driving wherever. Mm. And the thing is, is that when he went to the 1994 World Cup, it was a big, big deal for him. And, and apparently he, did, he had a fright. He had a fright. Yeah, well, Dutch, a Dutch journalist made a joke about a bomb scare. Yeah. And he'd been in, I think, a plane accident before and he'd lost teammates. Yes. So it's the final straw for him. But at that World Cup, I, I don't like to talk about it, but I was at that World Cup. <laughs> and on? The 90... Brazil, Brazil, Holland in the 3-2. Right. And he right. was mind-blowing in that game, Bergkamp. Mm. This was the World Cup, I, mean, I think Hullet missed it, actually. And that would have been the, the vital difference. Like, Hullet been there in 94. The Dutch could have won. Wow, of course, yeah. But Bergkamp... Come, he overcame all of that and he still was brilliant. Broke the record, didn't he? The goal scoring record, I think, in that goal against Argentina, was it? Oh, then that was 98, yeah, but 94, yeah, 94, 94 he was brilliant too. 94 was amazing as well. It was outstanding, yeah. Any more iconic moments? Or can I tell you mine? Yeah, yes, please, 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 yours, tell us yours, yours, Ryan. You want to take a walk? <laughs> take a walk, yes. <laughs> 31st of October 2009, Sky Sports commentary are just analysing Robin Van Persie's goal against Spurs at, Emir at the Emirates. When they cut back and Cesc Fabregas is gallivanted through the middle to put Arsenal 2-0 yes, up. Yes, And The great Cesc. The scenes, the scenes. It's like, a, there's a really, it's like a specific subgenre of the quick fire out of nothing. And it happens actually weirdly at Arsenal quite a lot. They did it against Man United a few years ago. They did it against Spurs. Is that when you used to win trophies? <laughs> this was after, this was afterwards actually. This was, this was, this was the, oh, I am. So wow. so Shots fired. So Shots fired from M. I know, yeah, I know. She's I going know. for everyone today. Yeah, talking about expected. Ex she's leaving nothing on the table, man. She's I stuck up for Man I stuck up for Man <laughs> Anyway, that's my iconic moment. <laughs> <laughs> there's so many though. That but there's another one. Though. I think was it? I, I saw drug like like now. You just come back. Drogba. I mean, Drogba scored a goal against Liverpool. Against Liverpool at um, Anfield. At no, at Stamford Bridge. Jamie Carragher. Oh, right. When he, he had a touch and turned and volleyed and it was just like... Was that, was that Anfield or was that... Was it, I oh, was, man, that was... Oh, I, think, I think that was definitely... Pepe Reni didn't move. Pepe Reni didn't move. The ball didn't just move. Entered, Bam. entered the net like a foot up. And it's the same as... And, and there's another one like even Adebayor for Arsenal against Spurs when that volley where he flicked it back there and volleyed it in. Oh, my goodness. You know, some of the... Well, summer Jamie Carragher, man, can you think of an, an, a Premier League... Like an elite level centre back that got such a torrid such time a over life, yes, and man. over again. Man got played with, bro. <laughs> Thierry had him like Thierry was Geppetto and he was Pinocchio. He just had him on string. You know, you know, the, no, I have a lot. No, in Carragher's defence, do you know why I feel sorry for him? He was like that field where they try out the new weapon for the first time. <laughs> Because, no, because a lot of things happened to Carragher we hadn't seen before. So the thing that Henri did when he like knocked it round mm -hmm. and then ran on the touch and it went, we hadn't seen that kind of thing before, really, at the modern level. So it was like, poor Carragher. He was like, oh, these are new tools. <laughs> could have yeah, been, been, been them out on Jamie could have been, exactly, could have been anyone. Yeah. We have to keep just always because Jamie's coming on next week. So we got to make sure. <laughs> <laughs> cut this, yeah, yeah cut this. Yeah. <laughs> um. Do you want to remind him of it when he's on? Well, to be honest, I'm going to have to say something to him. But one of, one of the things what he said, because I do love Jamie as, as, a, as a pundit. Amazing. It's one of the things what he, what he said, which really... When, I love listening to him dissect defence, mm. defending and players being in the wrong position. And he says, because somebody asked him about scoring on goals because he scored so many. And he said, if you, score in an on, if you score an on goal, you're already in the wrong place. 
you're already in the wrong place. And I thought to myself, see, that's the kind of insight you need because you shouldn't be there. And it's just like elite defense coaching. You know the whole trend of like apologies on Instagram? Mm. Caribou would be rolling out those apologies. <laughs> like every... You know what? That's funny. It's funny you say that. So I, I once had a player who scored a lot of own goals and she couldn't see anything. That was part of the problem. So many players, you'd be shocked with this, so many players don't bother putting contact lenses in. <laughs> you, you think I'm joking. And the amount of times I've said she can't see anything and they're like, I know, but she does. <laughs> Yeah, and I think that um, you have to consider that too with the number of own goals, the number of players that refuse to put contact lenses in, and it gets particularly worse for evening games. Oh my, of course, yeah. Foreshadowed. Deadly serious. Jeez, I never thought of that. It's wild. Wow. Did you see? I didn't have glasses at that time, so I was fine. Your your eyesight was fine. My eyesight was perfect. Perfect. Did you play with any players that... David Rowcastle. But really? the problem with David Rowcastle, he's, he's, his contacts getting get, getting smashed into his like the corner. Yeah, and that's why they uh, won't wear them. And I imagine there's, there's probably a lot of players get lasered now. Yeah, but, but then sometimes there was a period when they wouldn't have. And... Yeah, but there was there was times as well where we'd, we'd, be, we'd be playing and David would be like this, and then you go, "I've lost one of my contacts," and you're like, <laughs> "Well, do you know what I mean?" He'd be going like that, "Oh God!" And then you say, "David, we're playing." And he's, he's actually lo- loses his contacts while he's playing. He's, he's, yeah. That that happens. Yeah. Uh, we've got some questions. Go on then. Let's do all right, all right. Let's do the questions. <laughs> uh, first one is from Paul Hodges. It says, given Harry Kane's continually, uh, continuing poor form, should Gareth Southgate drop him for the forthcoming important mm. England game against Albania? No, no. Absolutely not um, for me because Harry Kane's our main guy. He's our main goal scorer. And... Yes, we're looking at Tammy. Tammy, I think Tammy scored the other day, didn't he, against yeah, Valencia? Yeah. So, nice you know, you, you want Tammy to continue to progress, to, to give Harry a push, but Harry, Harry Kane's going to score. So it's not like, oh, I'm going to leave Harry Kane out because so-called poor form with the, a manager that didn't know how to play him and can't get the ball to him. Harry Kane is just like what was happening with Aubameyang. If you can't get the ball to these guys, and Harry Kane does come looking for the ball, they're not going to score. It doesn't make no difference how many goals you score and how great you are. Harry Kane can't score goals if no one not give him the ball. So the fact is, is that Harry Kane always plays for me. And it's, it's the same thing what happened with Shearer. Remember Shearer before the 96? He hadn't scored for two years for England. He hadn't scored for two years. He was still scoring in that, but like you could see his confidence. He was different. Shearer started the, um, the year, he won the golden boot that year. Plus he got a manager who said, you're playing. If I'm Gareth Southgate now, I'm just saying to Harry, Harry, just come do your stuff, man. We'll get the ball to you, you'll score again. I, I don't like hearing people talk about Harry Kane, like, oh, what are we going to do with Harry Kane's poor form? Playing him. That's what I'm going to do. I think Play him. I want Harry Kane to play out of it. So he's on Paul. He is here, I think. So like, oh. The person who asked the question. Yeah. Paul. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm telling Paul. I think it's a great that, question, Paul. Has to play. Great question, question, though, Paul. It's a great question. Paul. Thanks for that. I got that out. Thanks, for, thanks so much for asking your question, Paul. It's really, really... <laughs> it's just... Please come again if we ever do another one. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Emma, we were having um, you were having a good chat with Musa before about the conversation about dropping players. Form's temporary, class is permanent, mm. and he's got it in abundance. But I, I, I always equate things to just what we all do every day in life, and there's all this is obsession that because footballers earn a lot of money, therefore their performance levels day in day out should should mean that they won't have a difficult or a challenging time, mm. and that's whether that's a dip in form for whatever reason, whether you're having a hard time in your life. You know, we, we deal with human beings every day and it's clear that it's a difficult moment for him, but I think it's important to stand by players. Mm. And for him, I think it's been, I mean, importantly, like you're saying, he's not getting any touches in the box. He's getting zero service. There's not been a shot and goal for Spurs. So... I think it's about getting Harry Kane back into the right areas and Tottenham and England giving him the service that, that put him in the position that's made him one of the best strikers in the world. Yes. Stand by him. Yeah, absolutely. I agree. It's like the Olivier Giroud thing, isn't it? Olivier Giroud, you see the World Cup, France 2018, the first, they played that front three of, I think, was it Dembele, Griezmann and Mbappe, and there was no fixed point, no pivot, and it was completely toothless. And they put Giroud there as the pivot and it changes everything. Mm. And even sometimes the player's not scoring as a fixed point, not just the experience, but the tactical sense. 
Like Kane dropping deep against Dortmund in Champions League is mind blowing, right? Some of his best play comes 60 yards from goal. Yeah. And then you, you get that playmaking and then people are running off him and then he gets his confidence back and the goal's maybe the last thing to come back. There's so much that Kane gives you beyond goals, actually. And that doesn't get enough credit. Yeah, that's how so I feel. I think a lot of people, we've, we've had conversations recently and I've seen a lot on, of people online starting to finally accept that form doesn't necessarily mean international starts because you are essentially building a team there as well. Yeah, absolutely. So just because someone's played really well for the, I don't know, the three or four weeks between international breaks doesn't mean they should be all of a sudden leading the line for a country when you have, especially with Southgate, when you're trying to build, trying to build momentum and like Emma said before, kind of evolve on, on the Euros. They only get about three days training every time they're together and then they play games. So you can't always make every decision about form because like you say, you've got to build the communications between players and while I think England finally have a healthy selection process, it doesn't mean that just because a player's in form, they, they should be in. And I think experience, right, you will know, really does matter in the, the top end. So yeah, That leads on to our next question. Okay, cool. From Kevin Holt for Ian. Do you have any regrets from your playing days? Well, um, no. Um, in respects of playing football, no, but... If I'm going to be totally honest, and this is the place where I normally do it because this is I feel safe in the in the house. This is why we do us we do the podcast. It's probably the person I turned into when I started to get the adulation. I think that um, I, I didn't I didn't. It's only when I look back now because I'm a different person now. But like it's a monster. How would you have coped with the social media as a young player when you were going through that? I probably wouldn't have coped with it very well because, like I say, you you end up you end up getting involved and going on there and then you, you've got faceless people saying really hurtful things like even even when Twitter first started and you go on it. Um, the, the lack of... And how would it have affected you? I'm just curious. When I was playing, yeah. it would have made me even angrier than I was because I didn't even realise. I was angry all the time and I remember watching, you know, when we watched Marvel and Avengers Assemble and the, <laughs> yeah, the bit yeah, when, yeah. when the Hulk, I loved the bit when the Hulk and Captain America said to him, Bruce, you're gonna. Bruce, we need you to suit up. He says, and he, and he actually said, "That's my secret." That's yeah. just, you know, he just said, "I'm always angry." Yeah. Man. <laughs> just, just turned into the Hulk, and I, 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 that resonated with me simply because I remember. Now I look back on, I cannot remember going into any football match where I was not literally teetering on the edge of craziness. <laughs> and what I was pleased about that was, is that yes, I got booked. I got sent off a few times in my in my last year. Um, for Arsenal, um, I got sent off at West Ham, and I got sent off in the tunnel at Celtic. Um, but that, oh. yeah, I got sent off in the tunnel because, like, it was you. I can't remember the name of the guy, but he was a real horrible guy. Um, he wasn't a nice, he wasn't a pleasant man, right? And he sent me off in the tunnel for saying something which wasn't pleasant. What I said to him. Did you say you're not a very pleasant <laughs> Don't man? Don't be yeah. <laughs> That's Yeah, but like, but it, the, the, the thing was, is the anger is what they always said that I have to try and channel. So I had that anger and then I, was, I, was, I felt like I was, because of the, the upbringing and the fact that I didn't feel, there wasn't a lot of love. So the love I was getting was just adulation and it was there while you were doing well. So I think I took that off the pitch and into my everyday life and I kind of like was walking like John Travolta in, in, in night fever down the street, <laughs> feeling like you're the guy all the time. And it, and I, it took me a few years, you know, to, to get over that, I was out of control. Ego's out of control. That's the only thing. I don't regret anything on the football pitch because I was just pleased to be there. And some of the times I let myself down and it used to really bother me because I used to think, oh, I've got a real problem. Mm. Sort of, you know what I mean? Am I ever going to be that person that can leave that and, and be that person? And people saying things like, yeah, but if you weren't, if you weren't like that, you wouldn't be the player you are. And I, just, I didn't know if that was a good thing. Mm. So I regret that kind of stuff. So stuff I think back on now. I don't forget how I played. I don't regret anything I did. You know, I apologise for absolutely nothing. But other than that, I, I wish I was different to the people right. that were in and around me at that time. All right. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> deep, uh, huh? The house gets deep. <laughs> um, this one from Alex Steeds. After Josh Cavallo, who plays for Adelaide United, recently came out as gay, why do you think... It it is there are no other publicly out 
top flight professional male football players in the world. Do you think that this will help pave the way for other players to do so in the future? Moose, Moose you, you want to take that one first? Uh, not particularly, no. <laughs> no, 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 I'm joking. I'm joking. No, of course, of course I do. Like, um, it's just, it's, the attention's overwhelming, isn't it? Mm. Yeah. You know, even it's if it's scary. positive, it's just overwhelming. Like I, I, when he, when Josh, that beautiful village, uh, met your line, I was like, I just hope that he, it's just not too much because even the love can be so much because he's a footballer. He loves playing football. He's defined by that. And to be defined by someone else, it's almost like weird. You know what I mean? Does that make sense? And that, that'd be my one concern. Like, I think things are going to change because you think football is now much more of fashion, like, especially like, for example, like just to shout out the Liverpool team, Jurgen Klopp, but also the players, their attitudes towards gay people, queer people, just exemplary, the way they've handled that. People like Jordan Henderson, just incredible. They don't, they're not neutral about these things. Jordan Henderson, like, you know, welcoming non-binary England fans to games, going, you're welcome here. And that's really powerful. On, 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 in relation to race, Harry Kane going, if you're racist, you're not welcome here. These, are, these statements are so bold. This is a new thing from England players to come out and be so overtly supportive and progressive, I think. So to me, that's why I think we haven't seen more players come out, I think. But also the problem is, from club to club, the atmosphere changes, you know, even from coach to coach. So some coaches are very accepting, progressive, other coaches, there's so many other challenges to get picked in a team, Emma, you know, it's one extra thing, isn't it, to worry about in the men's game. Like, you know, you're, just, you're concerned about fitting in tactically, adjusting to the new coach, and then like, well, you don't know what their views are on gay people. You don't know what the fans think, what the physio thinks. So it's almost like there's so many different variables. So my advice really to gay players is make sure your circle is secure, first of all. Yeah. Your partner, your friends, your people. Yeah, come out to them. Yeah, come out to once Come out to public. Why do you need to come out to everyone? You know, I think well, the, the reason, in, their, in defense, because when you come out, it's like, it's like you've been bottling something for so long. Mm. It's like a, almost a catharsis. You're free of it. But then the problem is you're not sometimes aware of what that can put a target on your back, I think. It's just so mental for me to, Sense, to have yeah. this conversation. And I'm in a women's football dressing oh, yeah. room where I've got couples, I've got conversations that are just so normal every right, day. Right, absolutely. So... For us, you know, we, we think, hallelujah, thank goodness. But at the same time, our next question is, if Australia make the World Cup, how's he going to be if he gets to Qatar? Like, just as, from an honest perspective, you know, uh, is he going to go and play in a place where he may be hung or whatever, be treated in such a way? Will he be persecuted in such a way? Is he going to be exonerated? You know, is he going to be protected? I think one thing. So if you... Yes, on one level, you know, it's, it's, ter it's terrifying to think that if you play football in Qatar or Hungary or anywhere, that you, you're, you're going to be subjected to something more than just vile abuse. Can I just say, actually, weird enough, but look at Elton John's career, right? Elton John played all over the world in autocracies over the place and he's beloved. And I think, unfortunately, the get out is always if you're excellent, people don't really mind. Mm. Like, you shouldn't have to be. You shouldn't exactly, no, completely right, completely right. You know, it's, it's sad, but there's no room for, there's no room for gay mediocrity. True equality is when you're terrible and you get just as much hell as everyone else for being a terrible footballer. That's true. The problem is, unfortunately, like, there's such a requirement to be excellent. And that's the get out card, I think. So, you, so what you're saying is it would, would be a lot easier if, if, if a, an unbelievable gay footballer came Yeah, out. it would be. We've done podcasts about this before on similar things because we get quite a lot of questions about similar stuff. Yeah, yeah. And Moose and I were discussing once, I remember, about whether we felt, this was maybe a year ago, I think, whether we felt that a uh, player in the men's game would come out as gay while still playing. And I think at the time, if I remember rightly, we said that the players do enough. They've got enough on their plates. They've got enough like pressure to um, compete at the top level. And then you're putting this extra burden on them to kind of change the culture as an individual. And it always, in my opinion, and I'm sure Musa will back me up here because this is what we talk about all the time, but federations and FAs and stuff like that, they should be the ones really pushing through the change to create a space that is safe enough. That anyone can just be like, yeah, I'm gay and I'm playing for a Premier League side and it's no big deal anymore. And I think that Personally, I think that what Emma said was really, really poignant about the World Cup stuff. And it's, again, we, we reference this quite a lot. Sorry to go on a bit of a downer. I'm sure there's a fun one coming up. But how federations often neglect their duty of care to their players. Yeah. yeah. 
And it's on them to make the changes that players feel safe enough to come out. Can I say one thing very quickly? Like, safe space. just a general thing about like the progressive thing with Black Lives Matter happens, players are coming out supporting. It's like, hang on a minute, how many directors did you hear from? Like, you know, the average like club director, how many chair people did you hear from? Advice? None, like none. They were. When the money is to be made, everyone's there on their hind legs. Yeah. Everyone's there in the photo. They're you can't get them out of the photo, but when it, <laughs> do you know what I mean? They're on their hind legs, but when it comes to the actual like progressive stuff, everyone's stum. And I'm like, this is wild. It's like kind of like I, who I can't I forget who wrote the essay, but it was like that kind of picks or it didn't happen activism. So exactly. actually do this stuff when people don't look. Exactly. And that's the really important stuff. Right. Real um, what you got? Ash Hodges. Do you think Stevie G is a good fit for Aston Villa? Yeah, absolutely. Who's <laughs> wow. Absolutely, I think he's a good fit. I think it's a brilliant move for him. Um, I think that um, Rangers, obviously, it's, it's, it's devastating news for them um, because he's leaving, especially mid-season. But there's no way, when you look at the way that Stevie Gerrard has um, gone to Rangers, where he's, he's, he's kind of in a bit of a bubble with the attention you get being a manager of Rangers or Celtic. But then, obviously, the football and the standard of football is not one like we're talking about the same as the Premier League. But at the same time, he has to win. He has to achieve. And he has to do well there. And when he went there, he had to sort out a lot of, a lot of things. And talking about a manager now, what, I think 38 games, he only conceded 13 goals. And you look at Villa and Villa leaking goals. Everything, what's happening with Villa is just like they need organising. They need structure. And they've got great players. And he's a young manager that, for me... To, to go in there now with his experience, because I'm mean, hearing their academy's got good players. That Ramsey in the midfield for them, I feel that Stevie Gerrard can get hold of him and he can, he can do unbelievable things. He came on for a, a short spell against Arsenal and you're thinking, wow, that guy's pretty good. So what Stevie Gerrard could do with those young players and the players he's got at the, the stature of the club he's gone to, Villa, you know, I think it's very, very exciting for Villa. It's very exciting for him. I think... It, I think he's going to do very well. He's taken all of his backroom staff with him. So he's safe in that kind of like um, respect. So I'm very excited for Villa with him. You know, just like how I was nervous for Patrick going to Palace because I didn't, you don't want them to fail. And it's the same, like, with, like Frank going to Chelsea. I was devastated in the end because I know that that might not work out and then he might have to leave. And it's happened how it did because they're a lot more ruthless. Like Patrick going to Palace, I just wanted him to... I just wanted him to do well because mm. of how great that on his stature and you want him to continue. It's the same with Stevie. But he's been learning his trade. Mm. And I think coaching is like any profession. You know, you, you, you have to go through a series of situations. It's not even just setbacks, situations over and over again to cultivate what you need to keep succeeding. And the Premier League is the best, so he's going to test himself against teams with more resources, more, you know, pronounced in their development. They're not in the top echelons, at least this season, regardless of the money they spent. But I think with the t his coaching team that he's bringing, I know the group he's got with him, I agree. I think they'll be organised. But I always feel sad when a manager's fired mid-season. Just very quickly to that, uh, what was exciting for me was watching how his Rangers team would play in Europe against Villarreal, they got a one or draw and I remember thinking, this guy's got the chops because that was the real test. The Europa League, such a great tournament, very deep. The other thing I would say is it's great for the mythology of Villa. Villa's a huge club, obviously, historically, got a, chat, got a European Cup and what that does, not just to the current squad, but the young players, not just but the youth, <laughs> Villa's youth talent is unbelievable yeah. and Gerard is going in there and galvanising. It's like, it's like the Chavi effect you know, the effect that Gerard has on Villa may not be apparent within the next two or three years. It could be three to five, five to seven years when people that were under his tutelage in and around the training ground, in the canteen. That, to me, is the legacy of Gerard. I think, that's really exciting to look out for. A couple of quick ones to finish. First one is for Emma from Ryan Hunt. Oh, that's me. Um, <laughs> uh, from the Arsenal assistant days, what was the biggest thing, looking back now, that you feel that you learn as an assistant at, uh, after your time at Chelsea as in the big job? Well, the first year was easy. I was there two years with Vic. The first year was easy because the mandate was clear. We had to, to take the team one step further. And I came into the club at the time with Karen Carney and Katie Chapman. The three of us came in together. And that was the difference between previous years of getting to that last hurdle 
what was already a wonderful group. And Vic Akers was, you know, he's legendary for so many things, but what he did so well was manage people. It, he wasn't, you know, it wasn't... A, he wasn't about tactics. I was obsessed with that. I was obsessed with the coaching. He let me get on with the coaching. But the way he managed players, and that was back in the day when before people got paid properly. So everybody got paid with envelopes somewhere along the lines of that's, that's her. And, because, and more because that's where the game was at. Yeah. And he sacrificed a lot to, to get the, you know, the girls what he could. So I learned the, that piece from it the second part was patience because I didn't have any the second year and I learned the hard way about that being an assistant what you you have a very very different role to play and I learned how to to develop the individual because when you're a manager it's so always macro it's always like you're you're a CEO I always say that you're constantly doing so many different jobs when you're an assistant you can do the quality work with individuals so I learned I learned how to do that and then realized I didn't want to be an assistant anymore I wanted to be a coach. <laughs> so they were my big learnings um all right final one from Ashley Wall and seeing as this panel is 50% Arsenal it makes sense to finish on an Arsenal one <coughs> As an Arsenal fan, it's great to see our recent run of form. However, in your honest opinion, how long do you think it will be before Arsenal are once again dun, 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 challenging for a Premier League title? I thought he was going to say Europa League. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I'll take it. Listen, I'll take it. <laughs> uh, I think a few... Do you know what my biggest takeaway from this? Emma Hayes is Emma, really uh, mean. Yeah. <laughs> given the opportunity. Given the opportunity. So, Nice one, Ian. Um, I wouldn't have it any other way, but um, I think there's a few, it's a few years um, mm. because when you look at you look at what the, the, those guys are like, look at Chelsea, City, Liverpool. Um, you even have to, you have to look at West Ham and West Ham's progression at the moment. You have to say what they're doing and how well they're playing and and the way they're they're structured and how they're playing. Obviously, they need to do something about backup for Antonio because they need to continue to score goals, but. I think that they're further on than Arsenal at mm. the moment. In, yeah. in, we're not even, we're not in Europe um, this season. If everything goes well, you're hoping that they can get back into Europe. But things have to happen at the, at the right pace for the team. That's the other day we played a team, and um, I think so. We had Aubameyang and Lacazette were the oldest, and the next oldest was 24 in Maitland Niles. It's it's average, a young youngest side, average age. Pretty much every game of the season. Yeah, but surely you see the plan, and I know yeah. sometimes there's been there's always a lot of criticism in amidst saying, oh, you know, what is the plan for? The I think that's always the hardest part when you don't bear the fruits of that, and you almost have to suffer mm. in a difficult period with so many young players. Yeah. But surely the fans can see there's can a, there see, is a clear yeah. plan there. I think the thing, one. the thing that worries me is just that I think the, the football and landscape, especially in the Premier League, is so vastly different to the last time Arsenal would consistently yeah. competing for titles yeah it's, it's like it's unrecognizable they had that you know they nearly went there in 2016 but before that you know like and we've just watched the the Arsene Wenger documentary this week and that kind of peak Man United rivalry it's just a different it's a different league and yeah. so yeah. Uh, I think I remember tweeting about this before and being you know cooked. Co not cooked just yeah stewed yeah, like low heat, yeah. low heat. very low heat. Braised. No, like doing, Bra like when you're doing, Braised. like, <laughs> you know, he says, like when you when you're doing baked beans, it says don't cook, don't just warm, just kind yeah. of like that. Just, just um, for se for just like it's saying like being patient, you know, mm. being patient and like this. We have to be team, patient. Yeah. I compared it to like a young NBA team, you know, like that are gonna have some dreadful losses but because you're now be competing great. with states. That's what you yeah, have to realize. Exactly. You're not dealing with just a team; you're dealing with a country. Wow. In different PSG and the squad depth, you like you know, Man money. City have got like Man City have got six players that could play number ten for an elite team and just like interchangeable. They're phone jealous, in. aren't you? Yeah, no, I love it. No, I'm. A, I am. I'm not because I'm a. I'm, I'm jealous. Is I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a football fan first, and I think that that my concern for Arsenal is just it's just that squad depth, isn't it? Like where it's like had Spurs have that thing where Spurs on their day. Pep used to hate playing Spurs because Poch had worked that out, and Poch gave everyone the blueprint. And the sad thing for Arsenal, I would think in the next five years, I would say. Arsenal might end up giving teams the blueprint to beat teams over the course of a season. You know, when Poch first went to um, Pep, he broke it open and Pep had to get new fullbacks in to work out this problem because 
basically Poch was just like playing, pressing everything quicker. Everything was half a step quicker. So it was almost like Poch gave over the blueprint, which they went unused, but Poch didn't have the means to execute. And I think for me, my problem with Arsenal will be they'll have the vision, but they won't have the tools. They won't have the actual pieces, if that makes sense. And I, I love what they're doing, actually, in the last sort of few games. I'm really excited. I think by maybe it. eventually they will, but it's just all incremental, isn't it? Yeah, of course. Yeah, you see the now football you see... fans are just not yeah, particularly but... patient. No, they're not. And, and you look at what we, you look at Emma Smith Rowe, you look at Saka. You know, it's very, very exciting. I, I think Benjamin White, and the way he can progress the ball, get the ball forward and stuff. But at some stage, you're going to have to find goals. We're going to have to find goals mm. in another elite striker to to then to continue to to press and get into just just the top six I think should be trying to get back into there before yeah. you start thinking about even the question challenging for the for the league years we're, we're years away from that when you consider what Chelsea are capable of with their manager what City are capable of at some stage you don't know what's happening with Man United but you feel like something's going to happen with them and they're going to come okay. we're, a cat, we're a catfish yeah. we're catfish United United we're a catfish <laughs> <laughs> But I think West, I think West Ham, West Ham um, are real at the minute. I, oh yeah, I, for sure. I, I for like sure. West Ham are real because they've got about seven or eight players who are playing the form of their life. Got managers all through that backroom staff, and their players are improving. I will say this before though. Say this before though. A penny for Jesse Lingard's thoughts. Wow. Because that team is perfect for what he does. Yeah, but what I saw the other day, and we spoke about it quickly, Moose, is, is that yes. You can see where Jesse is, is perfect for Jesse, but for Nels, exactly. scored a goal the other day. Say. That was the one. Which was, like, which was exactly what you think Jesse would do. So what we're seeing is that David Moyes obviously said, this, did you see what Jesse, that's what you need to be doing. Right, right. Attack you know, space. So, so if he can kick in and get some goals, Jared Bowen can get some more goals. You know, you can, they need the striker. He's not been great signing strikers down the years, Moyes. When you look mm. at the strikers he's tried to sign, you know, at, at Everton. You know. Because he makes particular demands of a striker, isn't it, with Moyes? Like, the way he sets up is difficult because some players like Haller, Haller loves touches, he loves getting into the flow. And with, you know, actually someone like a Lewandowski who basically is a one-stop shop who just like does his thing. Yes. Lewandowski, you could like freeze that man. It's like Han Solo could freeze him in ice for 50 years, <laughs> unfreeze him, he'd score. <laughs> just like, he's just that guy. He's a bionic, yeah. bionic footballer. It's really interesting to see if they can get that striker. Yeah. If, if West Ham can get that striker. Did you hear my take on Stadio the other day? What was it? What was your take? Why aren't you listening? <laughs> I haven't listened. I haven't listened yet. I've only just got uh, my car back. So I think she'd go after Lacquer. Do you think so? I think he'd be a really wow, good. That's a, it's a great shout. Roasting that's a take. great shout. Roasting hot take. It's not really. It's again, just keeping it warm. Just, just keeping it simmering. Braise, I don't braise, do hot. Braising yeah. cakes. I, you know something? I, I, would, I, I, I can see. I if can it see. goes. I, I think he'd be a really good fit. Fit for West Ham? Yeah. Wow. So once again, it's become an Arsenal podcast. <laughs> 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 All right, should we let everyone go? Yeah, listen, guys, thanks very much. Thank you very much, Ryan Hun. Thanks, everyone. Musa Konga and the great Emma Hayes. Thank you very much for writing. I'd like to say as well, thank you. Thank you very much to Barclays for making this happen for us. Akoya, Jeanette, you know, everybody, thank you so much for everything. Hopefully, um, everybody can enjoy the rest of the night. Thanks very much for coming. Thank you very much. Thank you. Nice one, Em. I can't, I can't. Come here.